can you share two things of yourself? One is when should people call you professionally? And one private thing people do not know. And in order, since we did, since I did not warn him, I would want to be fair and I share something like about me. Um, well, I started digital scouting as a blog and then exploded into a small consulting company. That's the professional part and the more private part is that I'm a recovering Allianz sales agent, but I've been clean for several years, so don't worry. I guess on the professional part, um, I guess I'm a technologist at heart, so I study computer science and I've been in various technology companies, so it's been fascinating for me to, I guess, be in the health insurance industry, which I am obviously now with Clover International, so that's been fascinating. By the way, my previous gig before this with Google in Singapore, so, you know, going from big tech to, like guess, big health. Right, um, on the private side, I guess, as probably stereotypical of a lot of you know tech nerds, um, I played a lot of MMO right when I was growing up. Uh, so I am a WoW player. So okay. to be fair, they did recently relaunch WoW Classic, which did you start all over again? I would say I managed to hold on to my willpower, and I have resisted. Though a bunch of my friends did you know rejoin, and I think they're relooking really their youth as it were. So. But let's talk about Clover Clover Hell. Um, and you had some significant funding rounds, um, I, I think, so I think that's also important to uh, underline uh, how big uh, uh, you have uh, become over the years. Um, maybe you want to share how much you have raised overall right now? Um, I think after in total we've raised close to about a billion dollars. Yeah, I, uh. <laughs> I just want to make sure that I get it right for the source, because when I looked at that, I was like, that's almost a billion with a B, okay. So just, uh, so there's a lot of, uh, um, uh, you have, I have to invest a lot. Oh, well, absolutely. Um, and then, of course, our most recent round of your research was closed earlier this year, 500 million. Yeah. yeah. So, congrats for that. But let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the content, what you are doing. Actually, you are in the healthcare space in the US, and there's a reason for the valuation and the funding you receive there. Maybe you share what are you doing exactly in the US? What can we learn, maybe also from other ecosystems, and what is totally different? Yeah, so, so I think I'll definitely start by explaining a little bit about what we do in the U.S. I think it is probably quite different to what people here in Asia are used to and seeing. So first of all, we are a health insurance company. However, there are a couple of interesting oddities, perhaps. One is we're part of the U.S. federal government Medicare program. Right? Is, is this good or bad? Yeah, it's good. It's good, right? Um, and and most of our you know members or patients or you know customers when I think of that are 65 years and older. Right, they, of course, as you know, the older you are, the more kind of health problems you have. So a lot of them do have a bunch of, you know, chronic conditions and things of that nature. Um, so I think we also do not have the ability to, I guess, do health underwriting in some sense, right? So there's an open enrollment period in the U.S. every year. Um, it's actually happening right now in the States. Um, so, you know, as people basically age in or, you know, during this kind of two-month period every year, you know, these seniors can choose which health plan they would like to enroll with. Right, and then um, when they choose Clover, and we hope that they do, um, we basically take them on and we, we care for them. But I have a serious question since it's only us right now, I think, okay? Uh, when I was an agent and I came back home and was totally um, uh, euphoric because a customer was interested in a full health insurance, my boss at the time said, uh, and is it a girl or is it a bad risk? You know, is he young and healthy and then he couldn't afford it, or is he a little bit older and has some issues and doesn't get the coverage? So I understand you are specializing on the 65 plus population with conditions. Um, how can you run a profitable health insurance with that? Yeah, this, this is a very good question. Um, and I think this comes maybe fits into the economics of some of the business model that we that we employ in the US. So um, we are paid by the government. As I mentioned earlier, we're part of Medicare Advantage, which is a you know, part of Medicare in the US. Um, so we effectively get some amount of money, it's capitated on a per person basis, and it is risk adjusted in terms of how sick they are. So to give you a practical example, maybe a 65 year old male, you know, smoke free, right, you know, runs marathons on the weekends, will get say $5,000, yeah. right? But somebody who's a little bit overweight, right, high blood sugar, diabetic, you know, maybe will get $7,000, right? So, so, however, once we get this money, I mean, that is effectively the risk transfer, if you will, from the government to us. Then after that, we have to care for these individuals. So the amount of health service that they consume, we will ultimately have to cover all. In some insurance um, industries, um, people handle that risk by you know not just you know having creative way of handling claims, you know. Um, but how do you do it? How do you handle this bad risk? And, and how, because you mentioned something like that, you will take care of these people. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So for example, um, like you know. 
like there was one example where we saw this particular individual, you know, had a lot of basically like ER and urgent care visits in this particular individual had, you know, COPD and some, you know, like respiratory problems. Um, and, you know, with elderly people, you know, there's also other conditions, for example, just frailty, fall risk, you know, I mean, obviously a senior can have a fall and have to have a hip replacement. I mean, these are all pretty expensive type of things. Um, so we actually have clinicians or care teams as part of our, our company, right? And something like, in this particular case, one of our, I think, registered nurses went and did a home visit. And what we found out that, first of all, this individual lived in the basement of, you know, this like multi-story building. It was a little bit damp, right? Perhaps some potentially even mold issues. Um, and actually by correcting for some of those environmental factors and, you know, accounting for that, and we're able to, you know, actually reduce the number of visits that this particular individual had. And is that typical in the American insurance uh, healthcare system that they have this more caring approach? Um, no, it is, it, is, it is not typical at all. And I, and, and I would argue that is what actually differentiates Clover and, and makes us fundamentally, I think, different to a lot of traditional health insurers or, you know, just insurance companies. Um, now we're not in the US, uh, we're in, in Hong Kong. And um, uh, why are you here? Good question. <laughs> So we're here because, first of all, we love the city. Um, I have no doubt personal reasons to be here, but you know we don't have to get into that. Um, but I, I think um, you know going back to what we were discussing earlier, it's like you know when you have this population, which you you in reality have no sense of how sick they are, right? So one of the first things you have to do is actually identifying you know the relative risk level of our insured members, right? And to that end, of course, just like all the other insurance companies, we built a lot of models leveraging data to predict, for example, population risks diabetic complications, right, all these things that we, of course, apply to a population. And as I mentioned, you can do some pretty arguably non-scalable things, but for the right subset of people, right? Yeah. So for example, you know, we have, we do provide comprehensive home care programs for a very select portion of our members. Um, and, you know, as we build these models, we, since we raised a bunch of money, as you pointed out earlier, um, some of our investors are here in Asia, and I think, you know, we got some interesting discussions, and it led to the fact that, you know, there's no such thing, for example, as like, Chinese diabetes or American diabetes or, you know, right? Um, so we felt like we should be able to leverage some of the technology, the models, the platforms, the approaches that we developed and help our partners here in Asia, you know, perhaps take better care of their population as well. So um, who, what kind of partners are you looking for around here? Um, I mean, we have been working mostly with, you know, large insurers, right? But I think at the end of the day, I think when you look at how we started, you know, even governments, I think, frankly, are quite interesting to us. I think some of this does apply to just public health policies in general. Um, you have been around for quite some uh, while, super successful, not only fundraising, but really also entering a market. What kind of, what kind of key learnings do you have um, from the US, but also looking at the um, Asian ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, I'm a self-confessed newbie, all things considered, to healthcare. Um, right before this, I was doing digital payments, you know, a totally different industry and space. Um, so I think for me personally, just learning about healthcare, healthcare ecosystems, how insurance work in general has been quite a journey. Um, one thing I will note, I think it's a big difference, is that in the US, right, insurers I think have a lot of powers over the provider networks. So for example, you know, like a lot of the ways you traditionally manage costs is by contracting, right, with a very select, hopefully high performing hospital group, and that's where you, you know, route all your patients, kind of, you know, very narrow, but hopefully well performing groups. Um, in Asia, for example, in Hong Kong specifically, as far as I can tell, like, you know, like, I go, I pay out of pocket, and afterwards I have to submit my claim, and to be frank, a lot of that's you know, paper-based. Um, so that was quite kind of shocking to me when I, when I first uh, got into, you know, into healthcare here. Um, you, you also mentioned that you help your um, target group or your customers with prevention. Was there, what, did you have a few um, examples where you said, okay, you have this one case with a person in the basement, but in general, you said we learned this also through, through our data, uh, we in analysis we do, and um, that's something people should do in prevention? Yeah, um, so for example, because again, we're part of the you know, federal program in the US, the government does actually put quality measures against a lot of health plans, right? So for example, there's a concept of STARS, um, and one of the care metrics is just like, elderly people, right? I mean, you know, most healthy people like you and me, we get the flu, it's not a big deal, hopefully, even though flu season is gonna come up on here soon. But, you know, if you're say 80 and you get the flu, I mean, that can lead to a lot of really, really bad complications. So even measuring something like, okay, well, what is the overall flu shot coverage percentage of your population, right? And towards that end, um, we interestingly, for example, have a behavioral science team at Clover, so we have a chief behavioral science officer, and he ran a bunch of studies saying like, okay, well, how can I get my members to get their flu shots? 
Yeah. Right? Um, and, and how do you do it? Okay. Um, so, so you know, a lot of times it's like, get a flu shot, take care of yourself. But what we found out that it's actually much more effective to ask the person, for example, you know, during the doctor visit, what do you care about, right? For some people, I'd be like, you know, like, I really want to play with my grandkids. Or, you know, I want to go, you know, spend some time with my spouse, right? So, for example, in that children's case, so what we tell them when we mail them or call them to get the flu shot is not like, please get a flu shot it's for you. We say, did you know that for young children, if you were to get the flu and pass it on, you know, you're actually increasing risk to your family. So, you know, I think by, you know, taking All those right. kinds of different angles, um, we see a noticeable rise, right, in terms of kind of, you know, getting them. That would also work for my mother in law, by the way. But don't, you know, <laughs> hopefully she did watch this. Watch this. So, one interesting question we had from the audience is about risk transfer, not only from the government to you or from ecosystems to you, but from you to a partner, like a reinsurer. How does that work and how do you do it? Um, so, I think, I mean, we actually like holding risk in some sense. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a I don't know, controversial thing to say. Um, but I do think that is actually the specialty of the technology that we have developed. Right? I mean, the whole business model in the US is the fact that the government transfers risk to us. We see ourselves as almost like a steward of this money. Right? As I was saying earlier, for example, we get a capitated payment per, per life. Once we get it, we can do nothing. And if somebody gets sick, we pay for it. Um, or if we allocate appropriately by doing preventative care, as we're kind of discussing, or if we you know, put them towards specialized care programs, we feel like that ultimately hopefully induces better health outcomes and ultimately you know, better health outcomes for members, lower medical expense claims for us, and that's how we win as a business. And do you have some data and some examples where you say, okay, we apply this prevention in this field and it really you know, saved us and this and that? Yeah, I mean, I have, for example, like you can look at all the historical um, hospitalization admit rates or the hospitalization admit rates. I think when you look at Clover as a whole compared to the Medicare kind of benchmark, we perform significantly better than kind of industry average, right? So I would like to think that you know our programs they they do work. Oh, okay, great. So data beats opinion. Um, uh, my next question is um, how. In, do customers react to this? Because they are used that it, it goes in a different way, and now yeah, there, there are you guys, uh, and um, you offer a different approach. Um, how do they react to that? No, I mean, that's a very good question. For example, I can turn around and ask you. I was like, when was the last time you called your insurance company and told them that you love them? Right? I, I think, frankly, um, most patients will probably trust their doctors more, more than they would trust their, their, their insurance company, right? But as a matter of fact, I think for Clover, um, we do have, for example, we send out members at Fashion Surveys. We see our net promoter scores as being, frankly, quite amazing, right? How are they? How, how, how high are they? I'm not sure if I can really disclose that, but I'll oh, say okay. it's, it's very good. Okay, so, I, so it's about zero probably. Yes, for sure. Okay, um, okay. I mean, okay. But I, I'm sure that have like minus 45 and they're surprised that you know, yeah. business doesn't go as well as back in the day. I mean, let me give you maybe a practical kind of business application of that, right? So earlier this year, we also announced Clover Therapeutics, right? Um, therapeutics, you guys know, is a development of you know targeted novel medical treatments, right? And of course, in order to do any of this, you have to like find people to participate in your study, right? Now, um, you can imagine maybe a traditional insurance company, if you were to cold call your members and says, would you like to participate in some random drug trial and, and study, right? Like, I don't know what people expect their anticipated kind of acceptance rate for, for those kinds of you know program enrollment would be. But I can tell you that at Clover it was astonishingly successful. I think it was like 80% or something amazing. Right. Oh. Um, and of course I mean you know we, we, we do the right thing like in terms of data separation on the health interest side of the natural therapeutics. But I think that was a, a very demonstrated about that, you know, the fact that we care for our members, we work so close with them, we're so aligned in terms of their health and our financial performance that um, you know we're really able to engage and work with our members across a lot of different care initiatives. Um, there's a question from the audience uh, about genomics. How are you using that and how is that perceived by the customer? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I mean, obviously I think it requires a lot of trust. Um, we are very good about keeping, I mean, those are two independent companies, obviously we're, we're related in some sense, but it's two fully separate companies, um, the data, the privacy, everything is maintained. Um, in this particular case, you know, we did publicly announce that we had a deal with Genentech Sign to do age-related macular degenerative. Another question is, how do you market this uh, service, this new way to the age group 65 plus, 80 plus? 
Yeah, so I mean, so some of this we do do very kind of old school marketing, right? For example, in the in the counties that we operate in the U.S., I mean, we'll do the classic billboards and you know like enrollment centers. But then we of course also try to leverage you know digital and, and some other things. But I mean, just bear in mind though, right? Like you know, we're not selling to millennials. These are people 65 years older. So there perhaps is a little bit of a technology gap. Though we're confident that in the coming you know five ten years, that trend as a whole will, will change. Uh, so, um, is it then true that this target group is not so tech savvy, or do you see already changes in, in use of tech and mobile and smartphones there too? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I won't lie. Today, for example, a lot of interactions are, for example, call based, right? Or even people will request specific mailings, even for example, right? Um, but we do see an uptrend in, for example, web usage, mobile usage. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, this is a lagging population, but I'm pretty optimistic. For example, you know, I have parents, right? They are just you know, retired, I and mean, I think if I look at them and their level of technology sophistication option, I, I am pretty confident that in the coming years that I, it will actually change their Well, you have been um, very successful as a company to, to set it up, to penetrate the market. Now you're even looking, obviously exploring international options, as I may read between the lines. Um, what kind of tips can you give, um, on the one hand, insurers um, that have a healthcare um, branch, uh, and also insurtech. But let's start with the insurers because we have a lot of insurers in the room. What kind of insurers, um, uh, what kind of three tips would you give them if they want to improve their um, healthcare um, insurance for yeah, USP? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would consider them tips. I mean, I can just kind of tell you maybe philosophically how Clover has approached the problem, right? Um, and then no disrespect to the insurance industry, but I feel like, you know, traditionally it has been quite transactional in some sense, right? Like I said, most patients probably wouldn't think of an insurer actively watching out for their health and care about their well-being and supporting these kinds of endeavors. Um, and I think, you know, that is an interesting mind shift, right, both from a patient as well as an insurer perspective. And how could we achieve this as an industry? Um, I guess, you know, perhaps rolling out more direct interventions or actually getting into the, you know, the actual um, flow of caring for the patients and being an active participant in that kind of care process. Oh, and uh, what, what would you recommend insurtech companies um, that are, you know, maybe close to health insure, uh, health insurance um, or healthcare? Um, what, what could they learn from you? Maybe in, like, also beyond the health aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so I like to think that Clover cheats in some sense, right? I mean, we like to think of ourselves as an insurance company, we also think of ourselves as a, as a technology company. And I think when you look at, you know, that, and, I, and I come from a more traditional tech kind of company background. And I think when you look at how tech companies build products or innovate, I mean, they have a very, very quick kind of loop, right, in terms of like, I can build something, I can ship something, I learn, I iterate, and I, you know, do that very quickly. We too, in 18 to 24 months. <laughs> That's right. Um, but I think, you know, in Clover's case, obviously, a lot of the things that we do on the technology side, we almost have this captive plan, right, that we basically, we can almost deploy, for example, if we build a new model, we want to try it out, great, just drop it in there, run some A-B tests to see what happens, right? I mean, that's a very kind of your traditional software development thinking, which I don't think perhaps exists at a lot of more traditional, shall we say, um, insurance. So my, 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 one of my last questions is, uh, again, the tips for the insurtech for startups. I mean, you have raised almost a billion dollars, which is, you know, a lot. Um, what could you um, recommend people that are, you know, series C, series A, series B? Is there something you say, that's something that the company that we did maybe wrong in the past or that um, we, others could learn from? Yeah. Um, okay, well, to be fair, like, I didn't found this company. Of course. Yeah, I can't claim. <laughs> you, you know the wall story, probably. I, I know some of the stories, um, but, but certainly I think for the for maybe the earlier stage, usually the more insured tech, tech companies, what I would say is, I mean, and I think this is the hardest thing, to be honest, for any kind of like enterprise sales, right? Things like, like truly find somebody who's willing to work with you and can actually, as I said, provide you that loop, right? That allows you to test, validate, and iterate as as possible, because to your point, if that cycle is 12 to, you know, 40, 24 months or whatever it is, that's, that's not gonna be very, uh, in terms of you know, just evolution, survival, right changing, that's not going to be very, very helpful.